Practically everybody is familiar with Valentine's Day, a day originally meant to celebrate a saint, which has now become a commercialised holiday to celebrate love and relationships. But did you know that in Wales we have our own patron saint of love, and her feast day has also become a day to embrace those that you love, and shower them with appreciation also. Today we will be delving into Dir Santes Duinwen, Saint Duinwen's Day, the feast day of the patron saint of love. In this video, we will explore Dwynwen, who she was, what her story was, what legacy she left in Wales, and how her feast day has been celebrated throughout the centuries, as well as today in modern day Wales. We will also be diving into some lesser known tidbits surrounding the lore, customs and traditions of Dyrd Santes Dwynwen. And stick around, even if you're pagan and have no interest in saints and Christianity, because this day is much more than just your average saint day. So first and foremost, when is Dir Santes Duinwen? When is the feast day of the patron saint of love? Well, that's why I'm filming this video now and uploading it when I am. Because Dir Santes Duinwen falls in January, specifically on the 25th of January. Dir Santes Duinwen is often regarded as one of the most romantic days of the year in Wales. It is a celebration which has become comparable to the more widely known Valentine's Day. Growing up in a Welsh-speaking area and so close to Aniskandwin, an island which is associated with Duinwen, I even know some people who celebrate Dir Santes Duinwen but refuse to celebrate Valentine's Day. We're only a few days away now from Dir Santes Duinwen. So in this video I will introduce you to who Duinwen is and what things you could be doing on her feast day to celebrate the most romantic day of the year in the Welsh calendar. So who was Duinwen? Duinwen lived around the 5th century in what is now the Brecon Beacon National Park in the south of Wales. Being the daughter of the legendary king, Brychan Brycheiniog, Dwynwen was a princess. Dwynwen fell madly in love with a man named Melon, and Melon eventually asked for Dwynwen's hand in marriage. Unfortunately, Dwynwen's father would not allow the marriage because he had already promised Dwynwen to somebody else. Distraught at the idea of marrying someone else, Someone she did not even love, and longing for the man that she did love. Dwynwen prayed for her feelings towards Melon to dissipate and disappear, so that she could be a good princess and follow along with her father's wishes of marrying who he wanted her to. As Dwynwen pled and pled and asked, please, for God, to take away her love for Melon so that she may go along with her father's plans, one day, an angel appeared before her. The angel came to her and offered her a potion. This potion, the angel said, will take away your love and answer your prayers. Dwynwen, wanting the heartache of the idea of marrying someone she did not love to go away, she drank the potion. But to her surprise, the effect of the potion was that Melon was turned into a block of ice. And so Dwynwen began to plead again, asking, please, can you just let Melon be released from this spell, turned back to normal, and so that he could live the rest of his life. As she called and prayed and asked to the heavens for God himself, God eventually answered. Firstly, Dwynwen asked that Melon be thawed and no longer be a block of ice. Secondly, she prayed to God that he would help all true lovers find their true love. And finally, as an act of sacrifice, Dwynwen said that if God answered these wishes, that she would devote her life to God, would never marry, and would never fall in love again. God granted all her wishes, Melon thawed and turned back to normal from a block of ice, and God vowed to help all true lovers find one another. In return for answering these prayers, Dwynwen devoted her life to God and became a nun. Soon after these events, Dwynwen set off to the Isle of Anglesey, Anis Morn, where she set up a convent on Anis Llandwyn. Anis Llandwyn is a tidal island near Newbuch in uh, North Wales in Anglesey. Back in Dwynwen's time, the island probably wouldn't have been an island, and it's barely an island today, it's a tidal island, so it's only an island when the tide is fully in. You can still walk to the island when the tide is out. It's likely that during Dwynwen's era, her island would have been a peninsula. Upon Llanwyn, Dwynwen set up a convent and lived out the rest of her life in service to God. Living as a hermit and devoid of love, 
Dwyn Wen devoted her life to helping others, and there are tales of her learning the healing properties of herbs so that she could help people with illnesses if they came to her. That version of the tale, however, is not the only version of the tale, and there are some sources that claim an older version of the tale is a little darker and delves into topics that are quite difficult to discuss. I'm just going to put a trigger warning here, a little content warning uh, for anybody who does not want to hear the rest of this section, because we will be delving into topics such as sexual assault, abuse, and violence against women. So if that is something that you do not want to hear about, I'm going to put a time on screen now. If you skip to that time, that's when I stop talking about this current topic, and we'll move on to the rest of the video talking about Dwyn Wen and the Santes Dwyn Wen. But I thought that this section of the video was needed to delve into um, the other aspects of Dwyn Wen's story. Aspects of Dwyn Wen's story that are still very much important to who she is as a saint or as a Welsh folk figure. Older versions of this story remain mostly unchanged from the version I just told you. The version I just told you is mostly the version that will be read in schools and will be found on tourist websites such as the Visit Wales website. However, there are a few details that have been changed from older versions of the tale. For example, in older versions of the story, when Dwynwen finds out that she cannot marry Melon because she's been promised to someone else, it is said that Melon either pushes himself upon Dwynwen, giving her sexual advances and trying to get her to um, partake in premarital sexual relations, or more explicit versions state that Melon loses his temper with Dwynwen and sexually assaults her. In these versions of the story, where Dwyn Wen is assaulted by Melon, the wishes and magical aspects given to her by the angel or by God in the more watershed version that I shared earlier are granted to her because of her resilience, her, the fact that she's survived this assault, or in some versions, um, if she manages to get Melon to go away, it's almost seen as a, a bit of a, a reward from God for denying his sexual advances, considering they weren't married. In my opinion, the older versions which delve into the topics of sexual assault and violence makes more sense to Dwyane Wen's story as a whole. When you listen to the more watershed version that is often shared in schools or on websites, it can lead to a lot of confusion. People might ask, well, where did Melon go after all this happened? Did he just vanish? Uh, why is he not part of the story later on? Or they might ask, well, the Three Wishes thing was a tad strange, where did that come from? Sean Lewis, author of Dwyn Wen, uh, Santes Cariaton Cymru, a book all about Dwyn Wen and the tradition of Dear Santes Dwyn Wen, talks about how Melon being turned into a block of ice might be a symbol, uh, a metaphor, or a suggestion that she has frozen his advances and rejected his sexual advances. And then in these older versions, the three wishes that Dwyane Wen wishes for are to be free of Melon. So Melon is thawed from the block of ice and then he goes home, vanishes. Secondly, rather than she wishes that God would help all true lovers, she specifically says, I want to help all lovers. I want to be there for people who are in need for lovers who are struggling, or for people who are struggling in their relationships. And so she takes on the, the characteristic of a person who is a helper to lovers, someone who helps lovers in need. And then of course the third wish being that she could devote herself to this full time, sacrificing her entire life to help lovers and to be in service to God. And then in these older versions, Dwyn Wen, as well as many other of her siblings, Brychan Brycheniogs, children go off and they preach about Christianity and God to the whole of Wales before eventually setting off on a little boat to establish their convent in Hianluin, Anis Hianluin. These omitted aspects of Dwynwen's story are important and I think they're worth mentioning even if they do make some people uncomfortable because it's part of the legacy of who Dwyn Wen is and why she devoted her life to helping lovers and helping others. Many people that I know who have a strong spiritual uh, relationship with Dwyn Wen or who work with her in the context of a goddess within more modern pagan spheres, many of those people are women who have survived sexual assault or abuse in some form and so they see Dwyn Wen as a symbol of strength and resilience and survive. I know that many modern day pagans who do revere Dwyn Wen as a goddess see her as a goddess who can help heal them from grief and trauma brought upon them by the uh, traumas that they've endured in the past. 
And I know that personally, Duin Wen is very important within my practice for these very reasons as well. Duin Wen can aid us in healing from our past traumas and empowering ourselves to not be defined by the pain and trauma that we've endured in the past. Now, the tale of Duin Wen feels like a piece of Celtic folklore. It speaks of potions and spells and magic in a way that most Christian stories don't. And this isn't something that's specific to Duin Wen's stories. If you look to many of the patron saints of Wales, they do rather magical things. And it's true for many of the saints in the Celtic nations altogether. But the truth of the matter is, this story feels like a piece of Celtic folklore or mythology because it is. The story has also been adapted and changed so many times. Some people theorise that Duin Wen and her story originate from some form of pre-Christian mythology, perhaps are the remnants of a goddess from the pre-Christian era. Personally, I have not found enough evidence to understand this theory in full, nor agree with it. However, I'm very open to it, and I thought it would be interesting to point it out here that some people do theorise that Duin Wen predates the Christian era and might have something to do with Celtic paganism. However, as with all things within the Celtic spheres, this happens a lot where people theorise that things are older than they are, or come from older sources when they might not be. But still interesting nonetheless, and one day I hope to dig deeper into that theory and see why exactly people think that Duin Wen might be some kind of derivative of a pagan goddess. I've heard whispers within the Welsh pagan community that her name might imply that she is a goddess, but again, I'd have to look into it further. But because of these theories that Duin Wen predates Christianity and is more than just a saint, many pagans today in Wales revere Duin Wen as a goddess rather than a saint. A goddess of love and relationships. Duin Wen's feast today, as I said earlier, is January 25th. So how can you celebrate Dirth Santes Duin Wen? Dirth Santes Duin Wen is celebrated today rather similarly to the commercialised Valentine's Day. On Dirth Santes Duin Wen, people exchange cards and gifts with those that they are romantically involved with. Many people upon Dirth Santes Duin Wen plan romantic days together. They plan to go on a walk together or to go to a fancy restaurant or to exchange gifts with one another. Personally, I grew up celebrating Dear Santa Duin Wen. It's not something that is celebrated everywhere in Wales, but it is becoming increasingly popular these days. But I've celebrated Dear Santa Duin Wen since I was a child, because I grew up in a Welsh-speaking area where I was only about a ten-minute drive away from Anis Hamdwin, Duin Wen's island, where, as you'll remember from the tale, she set up a convent. And so Dear Santa Duin Wen was quite important within our community and within uh, the schools that I went to. Every year, around Dear Santa Duin Wen, we would read her tale, we would talk about it, we would create and craft our own cards or craft items to take home and give to our parents, and we would just celebrate the Welshness of it all. I remember vividly making cards on Dear Santa Duin Wen to take home, and we would usually make these cards for our parents or our grandparents, uh, but some people sometimes would make cards for their school crushes and they would put them in their little um, drawers because we had these little drawers in the side of the room kind of like the idea of lockers in um, TV and such when you watch American school dramas um, we had these little drawers in primary school and people would sometimes sneak in little Santa Duin Wen cards um, on the Santa Duin Wen to the people that they fancied. Though mostly celebrated as a day to honour those that you are romantically involved with, the Santa Duin Wen can also be more than that. In my area, particularly, I remember people viewed Dear Santa Duin Wen not just as a day to celebrate romantic relationships, but love in all its forms. People would give cards and gifts to those they loved in any capacity, not just romantically. So as I said, we would often give cards to our parents, or our grandparents, our family members, those that we loved, or sometimes even friends. Friends, family, pets. Love is love, and I see Dear Santa Duin Wen not just as a day to celebrate romantic relationships, but as a day to celebrate love in its entirety. And also a day to focus on self-love as well, to honour yourself, and to love yourself fully. So even if you're single, or have no interest in pursuing romantic relationships for various valid reasons, you can still celebrate Dear Santa Duin Wen. It's a good day to remind ourselves that love does not always just mean romantic relationships. Love comes in so many different varieties and forms. And one type of love isn't any more important or better than 
another. Though Duin Wen is a Christian saint, I don't believe you have to be Christian in order to honour her or celebrate the Santa Duin Wen. As a folk witch, I don't personally identify 100% as a pagan, and so you will find elements of Christianity especially folk Christianity and Celtic Christianity woven into my practices. However, going beyond that, even if you are not a folk witch or not the type of person who weaves Christian traditions into your everyday practice as a pagan or a witch, you can also look to Dwynwen as a sort of goddess or entity that just embodies the idea of love and relationships within the Welsh cultural continuum. In many ways, Dwynwen is a folkloric symbol of love and relationships. I personally utilise the Santes Duinwen as a day to celebrate my romantic relationship, but also my relationships with everyone, my relationship with my friends, my family and my loved ones, and the love that I share for those people. I also see it as a day to celebrate my love for my passions and my love for myself, my self-appreciation, the ability that I have to look at myself and say, I love who I am, and I love who I'm becoming. It's a good day to remind yourself that it's good to be kind to yourself. Over on my Patreon this month, I will be releasing a Dwynwen inspired self-love ritual, which will be available to everyone, regardless of tier, as a symbol of my love and appreciation for those who support me. If you're not signed up to my Patreon and you'd like to see what else we get up to over there, there will be a link down in the description. Now, beyond the generic story of Dwynwen and the lore surrounding her as well, there's so much more that is to do with Dwynwen that not many people are completely aware of. For example, did you know that there's a divinatory tradition surrounding her island and Dirth Santes Dwynwen? Over on Anishianluin, the island where Dwynwen set up a convent, there is a holy well. Now, it is said that at one point, this holy well used to be full of eels of some variety. And in many pamphlets on folklore or in books where people have recorded various folk traditions and customs, there is talk that occasionally, if you went to Anis Hianluin, you would find a diviner sat by the holy well, reading the way that the eels move and shift in the water. And by looking at that, they would be able to read into the future of the lovers that attended. And the remnants of the holy well can still be visited today at that spot. Anis Hianluin became a rather important shrine during the Middle Ages, a shrine to Dwynwen herself. And though the practice of venturing over to the island, because at one point people used to pilgrimage over to the island in order to visit Dwynwen to bless themselves or to ask for true love or to bless a union between people, Though that fell out of fashion after the Middle Ages, nowadays the love and appreciation for Dwynwen is growing once more. If you visit Anis Hianluin on the Santes Dwynwen today, you will see a lot of couples walking together, you will see a lot of people going there visiting the island on her day. Last time I walked to Anis Hianluin on the Santes Dwynwen, I remember uh, I reached the island and unfortunately the tide had just started coming in. Um, so there were some people stranded on the island, I was stranded on the mainland, couldn't get onto the island, but there was all of a sudden, out of nowhere, on this one wave that came, there was about a hundred red roses just floating in the sea. One hundred red roses just floating in the water between the island and the mainland. And I have no idea who released them, what was going on, or what they represented, but it was a rather magical moment, just walking towards the island, and as I sat, stood there, looking out towards the island and the waves were coming towards me, just these roses appeared out of nowhere. It was rather magical. <laughs> Many Welsh people choose to get engaged on the Santos Dwynwen nowadays as well. As I said, it's considered one of the most romantic days of the year in Wales and is comparable to Valentine's Day, and so a lot of people, they do get engaged at this point in the year. Some people follow in the tradition of the love spoons. So a love spoon is a type of carved wooden spoon, which um, in days of old, uh, suitors used to present to their maidens as a form of showcasing that they wanted to marry them eventually, and as a way of showing the father of the maiden that, look, I'm good at woodworking, I can craft, I am practical, and I can provide for your daughter. Though most people nowadays would probably rather pop down to Pringles in Hanvad PG to buy a wooden spoon off the wall, which are quite expensive, <laughs> rather than trying to carve one themselves. One day I might make a video on the history of the love spoon or the wooden spoons in Wales, but I don't know if many people would be interested in that. 
And another piece of uh, lore surrounding Dwynwen that not many people are aware of is that she's not just the patron saint of love and relationships. She's also the patron saint of sick animals. She's associated with sick animals, and I have seen some people uh, see her as associated with animals in general. So if you have a poorly animal, call to Saint Dwynwen. You don't know what's going to happen. Well, that's it for today. Thank you so much for watching. And I hope you have a beautiful St. Duin Wednesday. Did Santes Duin Wen Hapis i the Don't forget to click that subscribe button if you have an interest in all things to do with Welsh culture, folklore, mythology, and magic. And please remember that my book, Welsh Witchcraft, A Guide to the Spirits, Law, and Magic of Wales, releases next month in the US and just over a month in the UK. I cannot believe that time has gone by so quickly that it's already here, and it's going to be in people's hands soon. So if you haven't pre-ordered your copy of Welsh Witchcraft, A Guide to the Spirits, Law, and Magic of Wales, then maybe now's the time to do it. Treat yourself. Show yourself some self-love in the eyes of Dwynwen pre-order Welsh Witchcraft. If you want to, of course. And leave a comment down below letting me know that you've pre-ordered it, because I would love to hear it. If you like my videos and you'd like to support me further and help me keep doing what I do, keep researching into Welsh lore and providing you with the tools to delve into the magical lore of Wales, then please consider supporting me over on Patreon. If you do support me over on Patreon, you get access to exclusive content that nobody else gets to see. Uh, depending on your tier, you get to see all sorts of exclusive videos and posts, and throughout 2022 I have decided to commit myself to making as much content as possible for Patreon. So, there's no better time to sign up. If you can't sign up to my Patreon, don't worry, you can follow me elsewhere too, and that would be an amazing amount of support. You can subscribe to me here on YouTube, follow me over on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, everywhere. <laughs> But that's it from me today. Thank you so much for watching. Do let me know in the comments below as well what you plan on doing on Dear the Santa's Twin when, if anything at all. And I will see you next time. Goodbye.